Now, um, since we're talking about attention being held or being drawn to an improbable stimulus, which is um, embedded in a train of uh, more probable ones, then I guess we should lend some consideration to the effect of probability um, and indirectly to uh, the, the, the rate of, of sound presentations. Um, and I say indirectly because um, a higher rate of sound presentation will itself increase the probability of, of a sound occurring, of course. So here we have um, a, a series of traces, actually just one here, but I'll show others in a few seconds' time. Um, here we have traces evoked by the non-target, the standard uh, stimulus, in an oddball stimulus setup. And, th and this is useful from uh, a starting point of view as to the general effects of rate on the uh, the obligatory responses that are produced by the more probable, the, the non-target uh, tones. So in this case it was a 1 kilohertz pure tone sound um, presented just a comfortable volume to, to a normal hearing listener and the stimulus probability was 0.8 and we can see in this first trace uh, the, the obligatory responses here's the, the uh, P1 here, uh, the, the N1 and the P2 up here uh, arising around 40 or so milliseconds uh, then about 85 and then around 160 milliseconds uh, respectively now importantly here the, the rate of the stimulus train was 0.5 hertz uh, but if we just overlay uh, another one uh, if, if we just uh, overlay another one there um, these are the, the responses to the same sounds um, but just at a slightly faster rate of 0.6 hertz uh, so more frequent in temporal probability and we can see certainly um, by uh, gazing at the N1 peak um, a, a smaller amplitude and again if we increase the rate again to, to 0.7 Hz um, then we can see the amplitude of the N1 drop even still so I'll just place a baseline here just to draw your your uh, your eye um, and then here we have uh, three dotted lines showing the amplitude of the uh, M1 at these different uh, rates of presentation and um, we can see that the amplitude is greatest for uh, the the uh, the slower rate and the least um, the, the the least uh, with the faster rate. Now moving our discussion back to the P three hundred for a moment, since I mentioned that uh, those are traces from uh, an oddball uh, paradigm. So uh, here the the oddball the target sound was a uh, one point five kilohertz sound um, presented at a stimulus probability of point two. So that means uh, automatically that um, there are going to be far fewer of these traces, the ones of interest, uh, than the standard that we were just looking at. And so correspondingly we uh, expect a, a lower signal to noise ratio for a fixed number of suites. Yes, but, but here we can again we can see that as the, the rate increases, uh, so 0 0.5, 0 0.6 and 0.7 hertz, um, then the, the probability that a target stimulus will occur also increases and so when that happens um, so here we have the, the probability uh, 0.5 hertz so the probability is lower and then 0.6 hertz and 0.7 hertz so we can see that as the uh, probability of the target increases um, it occurs more often and so the P300 uh, reduces in amplitude um, conversely when the uh, probability decreases then we expect an amplitude increase. Now um, just as an aside I think an interesting uh, feature of, of this slide is that in these um, in these traces the the, uh, the P300 seems to be dominated by the P3A um, just sort of judging that by the latency of the positive peaks um, whereas the P3B seems uh, I would say all, all but absent, um, at least uh, on the on the face of it. And uh, although there is, you you could say there is uh, uh, some evidence of that N2B just preceding uh, the main positive going response. Um, but perhaps part of that, uh, part of the explanation for that reduced positivity, um, as compared with certainly the earlier traces, might rest with the issue of um, uh, partly signal to noise ratio. Um, but it's, it's usually uh, uh, possible to observe a P300 perhaps 
um, of, of 10 or more microvolts in amplitude after just a handful of uh, repetitions averaged together um, in order of course to, to, uh, to, to cancel out any unrelated noise um, and in fact single, single trial data can be obtained um, whereby the response is sufficiently clear with, with no averaging at all but uh, commonly the, the response is analysed after um, perhaps 50 to 100 sweeps to, to achieve that signal to noise ratio but you know a stimulus probability of 0.2 um, then then a hundred sweeps of uh, of a target uh, sort of requires another 400 sweeps of the uh, the non-target the frequent stimulus um, and that's a process that is going to take you know 15 to, to 20 minutes depending on the, the chosen rate of presentation so um, this discussion about probability and stimulus rate here sort of highlights I think a technical challenge faced by the uh, the examiner um, and it's of particular relevance to the clinical examiner as it, as it follows that the, the longer the test time uh, the better will be the signal to noise ratio in terms of um, having more averages to uh, more, more sweeps to average together but the more likely it then becomes that attention will fade or drift over the course of the trial and uh, and that would act to reduce the uh, the attentional dependent response. Um, on the other hand, a, a shorter test time um, might mean a higher focus of attention, so to speak. But that would be at the cost of um, reduced signal to noise ratio um, in the in the average, either because of fewer trials obtained, or you've got the same number of trials but at such a high rate that the the temporal probability was high. So either one of these uh, will, will sort of act to reduce the um, amplitude of the attentional dependent P300 um, particularly the P3B and the approach uh, taken here was to have a longer trial time um, but that might might be you might speculate uh, why the, the traces we see here have a much attenuated P3B perhaps attributed to that drifting of uh, um, the focus of attention over the over the duration of the test but um, I say that's uh, of particular relevance to clinicians because um, in in the clinical setting, um, you know, a lower number of sweeps means uh, greater residual noise and more variability in the traces, and you've just got that one individual. That's the that's the question from a clinical point of view. Um, it may be that uh, discrimination or attentional abilities that you uh, wish to index with the P three hundred. Uh, um, perfectly observable on a group level um, and you could get a high signal to noise ratio just by averaging together the responses from many individuals and then of course comparing that to controls but um, in in the clinical setting uh, you, you may be less able to make such uh, such firm conclusions about the the individual um, uh, because you haven't got the ability to, to generate grand averages um, in the quite the same way. Now uh, we we could sort of take the the probability uh, the sorry the discussion of probability to the opposite extreme, um, because we could ask ourselves what would happen if um, we had an oddball paradigm, but this time the, the the subject was asked to attend to the frequently occurring sounds um, by counting them um, and ignoring the the rare sounds and so this slide helps us to uh, visualize this effect um, because uh, well what we see in the top two traces is uh, a standard oddball paradigm um, with no particular attention asked of the listener and uh, we had the 1000 hertz uh, tone presented with oddballs of uh, 1500 hertz and uh, so as I just draw the uh, the cursor across what we see when we uh, have that oddball um, occurring is uh, uh, this negativity, um, the, the the mismatch negativity, and then uh, when attention is captured by the sound, also we see this uh, uh, this P3A triggered ac accordingly. Um, so no attention here. But what about in the opposite uh, scenario where we ask the the listener to to actually um, uh, count the frequent uh, occurring sounds? So the target is is the standard sound and the non the non target to be ignored is the oddball which occurs infrequently um so it's exactly the same stimuli 
Um, and what we can see here is that the non-target uh, becoming uh, the, the improbable may itself um, trigger uh, an MMN and, and a P3A complex, but the target uh, sound is so infrequent um, that uh, that it um, that, that it's 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 hard to see any clear positivity, any P3A or, or P3B associated with it, as compared to uh, when it's improbable in the in the uh, in the upper trace. Now, um, what about the effect of a task difficulty? So as the discrimination task becomes more difficult, um, then we expect the P300 to increase its latency and perhaps also reduce in amplitude. At some point, then, it, it seems that we might predict that as the task becomes uh, so difficult that discrimination isn't possible, or at least it isn't always possible, maybe the, maybe the uh, subject doesn't always get the, uh, the, the correct answer, then the P300 might disappear altogether, or it might only be apparent in the sweeps where um, the detection was a successful detection. And um, some of these concepts are, are demonstrated in these traces, measured within a single session from one normal hearing listener. And what we see are just the traces for the oddball presentations, the target, not the accompanying um, presentations of the, the standard or the, or the difference traces. Um, which, which in all three cases uh, the, the non-target was uh, a 1000 Hz pure tone. But in the lower trace um, what we see where was where the target was um, a 1500 Hz pure tone, so 500 Hz higher in frequency um, which for a normal hearing listener should be um, with the sound well above uh, their hearing threshold should be an, an easy discrimination task and what we see here is a relatively high um, P, P3A uh, anyway, while perhaps the P3B here is uh, a little later and, and lower in amplitude, around 330 milliseconds. So somewhat uh, smaller than what's uh, what we've shown in the earlier slides, which I've sort of attributed to the higher number of uh, trials and the long session time which this uh, um, which this uh, volunteer gave. But in any event, we can also see that um, evidence for that N2B response just prior as as well uh, around this range. But if if we uh, shift our attention to the middle trace, uh, where the discrimination task is somewhat harder, because now we have the the 1000 hertz um, uh, uh, with the target now uh, the oddball of 1016 hertz, so much closer. Um, frequency between the standard and the target um, and what we see is what appear anyway to be uh, later and uh, smaller versions of the uh, P300 uh, later in latency while shifting our attention to the upper traces where it's an even harder discrimination task again I mean I find this one particularly hard um, with such short duration uh, tone bursts uh, 60 milliseconds or so um, and it, it's far harder to to identify um, any real evidence of um, discrimination having uh, having occurred. Now, just because the um, the P three B, even though at active attention was being paid during these traces, the the uh, the long test time, um, I'm assuming, is uh, the explanation here for the the very small P three B responses. So um, I just thought it would be uh, wise um, ju just to uh, show the effect on a, on a group level as well, um, just to make that very clear. So uh, here I've just uh, sketched out the, uh, the, the results from a, a previously um, published uh, paper here. And uh, these are the uh, uh, grand mean traces um, from uh, three different discrimination tasks. The solid red line shows a, an easy frequency discrimination task here, um, whereas the uh, the broken line in the centre here shows um, a level discrimination task, uh, slightly lower in, in amplitude, but when we have a, a much harder level discrimination task shown by the dotted line, then here we have um, both reduced amplitude and a longer latency uh, P3B wave. So um, a brief summary of where we're up to so far. Uh, so we've talked about the P300 um, being elicited to uh, an oddball stimulus paradigm whereby uh, active attention 
is um, focused on the oddball so that's the target sound and we've talked about the influence of uh, target probability and uh, the, the presentation rate or interstimulus interval as well as um, the uh, the salience uh, whether or not it's a, um, a, a task relevant such as an overt counting game or or or, um, or an internal uh, counting task as well as the tax complexity so the uh, the difficulty of the discrimination task and um, of course um, widely used in research as a as, a, as an insight into uh, into the effects of uh, auditory cognition but also um, uh, uh, with uh, at least postulated various clinical applications as well so in this next part of the talk we'll just um, we'll just touch upon on those a little bit more I would just like to um, provide some uh, um, discussion as to uh, uh, from a technical point of view uh, so we talked about possible electrode montages that might for example compare um, frontal versus parietal um, uh, amplitudes and it might be that the uh, response is reference to uh, a midline like the nose tip or the, or the nape, of, nape of the neck um, with uh, a common position uh, very often just sort of equidistant um, between the two active uh, positions, so a uh, forehead position would be quite common. Um, needless to say, uh, we would uh, encourage always very low impedances and a balanced impedance uh, across the uh, four electrodes here for our two channel instrument. So anything three kilo ohms or, or less would be um, absolutely ideal. And for those that um, are interested in the uh, this sort of the recording and this and the stimulus uh, parameters. Then I've just um, provided this uh, uh, this screenshot here of the of the protocol setup um, as as it might be in the uh, interacoustics eclipse device. So um, rather a busy slide, and I won't spend too much time. But I'll just draw your attention firstly uh, to the bottom left. Um, this is where we have the control for uh, setting the the rate of. Uh, the frequent and uh, rare or target sounds um, and uh, yeah very common for uh, the rare sound to occur with a probability of 0.2 or, or 0.1 over on the right here this is where we um, control the the the, uh, the recording window the length of the uh, the epoch and um, I'd always encourage this to be out as far as possible really it may be that while the P300 is typically occurring around 300 milliseconds but depending on the uh, the complexity of the discrimination task as well as other features uh, it, it may be that the the, um, the the response can occur much later indeed so by having a wide recording window then it maximizes our um, our chance of capturing that response um, as well as having the pre-stimulus uh, baseline and one of the um, uses of this amongst others is to help the observer just to estimate the, the residual noise and then just drawing your attention to uh, the top left this is where we would uh, control the stimuli and the very stan uh, standard or commonly used stimuli for this would be the, the tones that I've discussed um, but it might be that more complex uh, stimuli are, are, in, are, uh, are, are desired and in this case then it is possible to um, as I'm showing here to set the eclipse up in such a way as that it can be um, in a sort of passive uh, recording mode where it uh, it doesn't itself present the stimuli but these might then be presented by uh, some other specialist software from a different source and then the, uh, the the Eclipse device here is slaved to that software such that it just records the response um, at, the, at the appropriate moment. Um, just in summary of those um, uh, parameters, so very commonly we might have a, a test probability of uh, as I say 0.1 or, or 0.2 um, and a lower probability for a more complex discrimination task would be um, uh, desirable and of course the task itself um, that needs to be matched to uh, to the the ability of the listener so um, so if it's someone with uh, um, reduced uh, cognitive capacity for some reason and uh, maybe they've got dementia or, or other um, or, or other features then it, it could be that um, a passive listening task is actually all that's feasible uh, there's no active attention that you can draw to the the target sound in that case it, it would obviously um, be that the, the P3A 
in particular as well as the MMN are of what's uh, relevant and less so the P3B since we've discussed that that's more um, relevant to, to active attention. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's also, as you can see from the lower line there, um, uh, where I mentioned jitter analysis and another single trial um, analysis is possible. So um, it, it's very important to mention this option of single trial analysis, I think. Um, since the response is um, apparent sort of very typically after around 100 uh, sweeps, maybe 50 to 100, but um, in many cases the, the, the somewhat large response could be observable just on an individual trial with no averaging. And so by having the option of uh, looking at uh, the response in each individual trial, then um, it could be that you can uh, d do complex analyses um, such as uh, tracking the way the P300 changes over the course of a session or it could also be used for this um, correcting for any uh, latency jitter any differences in the in the latency of the peak from one trial to another and then that can be corrected simply by uh, lining up the P300 peaks um, and that would in the in the average of them of course create um, a larger amplitude response in the process so I've just uh, taken a moment to actually uh, uh, just just display what this uh, output of uh, single trial analysis uh, looks like. So um, bear with me while we see sort of uh, have quite a busy slide here. But what we can see if we just highlight one um, one line of results, then uh, we can see that there are two memory banks. Uh, there's the A buffer and uh, there's the B buffer. And the A buffer stores the uh, single trial data line by line um, for a standard sound and a B buffer and I'll just draw your attention to an example here where there's response recorded in the B buffer um, that records uh, the single trial data for the target sound um, so from the output here if we can highlight another one sort of further down where there's a response in the B buffer so um, we we know therefore the the order of the, the sound presentations um, whether it was an A or a B in which order and we can reconstruct the traces um, accordingly uh, like in the example of um, performing a jitter analysis or maybe to observe the way in which the response size increases or decreases or, or other questions that, that we might have so for instance if we were to reconstruct um, one of these responses in the B buffer uh, in fact it's the first of those that I just showed um, then this is what we might end up with It's uh, it's a response which is uh, um, reconstructed unfiltered that is it has the properties of the physical amplifier filter settings but not the uh, software or digital uh, filter settings but nevertheless uh, we can see in the uh, central region here this uh, this positivity which we associate with the P300 there is this negativity slightly further back the N2B as well as this smaller negativity uh, the, the um, the, the N1 response and that's just on one single trial if we were to uh, reconstruct using the, uh, the the output there um, all, all of the uh, um, all of the responses in the B buffer so the average trace then uh, again that's filtered according to the physical properties of the amplifier um, but but without the digital uh, filtering and if we were then to apply the digital filtering we can of course get back to um, the f more familiar sort of uh, traces that we were seeing there again here's the N1 the uh, the N2B uh, there and then uh, this positivity associated with the um, P300 now uh, what I'd like to do is just move on uh, to just consider um, a range of clinical applications or at least potential clinical applications of the P300 now there are a range of, uh, of, of biological factors um, that could affect attention including uh, for example attentional capacity um, in the first place any fatigue um, features of the uh, um, the way in which the brain is structured which is um, sometimes uh, um, generalized from whether or, whether or not the patient is right-handed or left-handed um, other factors like the age of the the listener um, drugs drug ingestion that they might be on um, I'm sure that's not an exhaustive list but anyway 
Um, that in addition to the, the factors that we've discussed itself in the test session, like the varying focus of uh, attention or arousal or the difficulty of the task. So um, so the response is for all of these reasons, perhaps not surprising that it's uh, variable from one person to another. Um, and, and that creates a wide range of what is, let's say, normal or expected. And so um, it stands to reason that the discrimination task would need to be appropriate for age and other um, uh, matched in other ways to the capacity of the listener. Um, and even if uh, mere passive attention, just to observe that P3A is, is all that's possible, um, then you know, there's likely to be, um, on an individual level, a range of possible um, outcomes for the P3A and the, and the P3B. Um, but when when the appropriate um, methodology is uh, adopted, then um, the response, even on an individual uh, level, can nevertheless um, potentially provide uh, useful insights into um, a range of, of uh, clinical abnormalities um, where the clinician might benefit from some index of, of cognitive function or possibly to um, track progression or the effect of um, an, an intervention on a possible disorder where where um, auditory processing and uh, the ability to to focus attention is impaired, um, and so this this slide just sort of lists of a number of those clinical applications, uh, potentially wide ranging from from childhood to to adult disorders, and it might be that um, many different disorders all lead to um, some alteration in the in the P three hundred amplitude. Or, or latency or, or other parameters, maybe morphology. So that you might say that somewhat uh, limits the diagnostic utility in terms of differential diagnosis, uh, if many different disorders can all lead to a change. Um, but um, the utility might therefore be, um, yeah, in, in, as I mentioned, in some providing some index of uh, sensory, auditory in this case, um, information. In, in what is uh, a relatively quick, um, inexpensive, and of course, um, objective fashion. So for more information, then I'd of course refer the read, the interesting reader um, or listener to, to this uh, um, fascinating uh, reference here. But um, as an example of uh, one uh, clinical group from, from this list, then um, I'll just take some moments to uh, focus in on, uh, on the example of schizophrenia. And that's been widely uh, studied, patients with schizophrenia and the effect of the, um, th that condition on the P300. Um, and, th and the results of one such study I've just sketched here, um, just, uh, just for an overview. And uh, uh, what we can see is um, uh, two, two sets of P300s on a group level anyway, those from a control group and the schizophrenia group. And what we can see is uh, that the P300 in those with schizophrenia, the dotted line, um, is reduced. And uh, this is a discrimination task involving uh, a 1500 hertz uh, target tone, um, which is an oddball with a 1000 hertz standard tone. So much like the sounds that we've been looking at so far. And this, uh, this, ampli this sort of amplitude reduction is a very classic finding in, in these patients, um, something that's been described in, in various uh, studies dating all the way back to the 70s. Um, but interestingly, um, from the perspective um, of, of identifying those at increased risk of a disorder, then uh, one, one um, finding uh, presented by these authors was that uh, the, uh, the response in family members, which I'm now showing here, um, uh, was, was, was also uh, reduced compared with um, uh, controls. So that gives uh, some insight into um, the perspective of identifying uh, you know, those with um, perhaps increased risk of a disorder, um, but who actually may not have it at that moment. Now, uh, just moving on, here are some sketched results again, sketched of uh, um, another important topic in the, in the same, um, sorry, another important study in the same topic. And uh, these data stem from research done in the 80s, and it was a, a group of um, 26 uh, schizophrenic patients, 
and uh, I believe 10 match controls. And the data on the left show sketches of uh, grand mean responses from these two groups um, evoked with an auditory discrimination task. And uh, th the task was discriminating between uh, 600 hertz and 1000 hertz sounds, the target being the lower frequency. Uh, of those two and occurring at a probability of 0.1 and again we can see that larger P300 there um, in the controls and then the smaller um, smaller P300 in those with uh, schizophrenia however um, just drawing your attention to the yellow traces on the right um, so that is a P300 um, but this time evoked to a visual discrimination task uh, whereby the patient was uh, shown one of two letters on the screen, an S and an H, and then they had to target the S uh, in an oddball paradigm. And here the, we had the P300, but there was no such um, reduction in, in the amplitude in those with uh, schizophrenia, and that was uh, taken here by the authors as a, a suggestion that you know a core, fe a core feature of um, these patients is reduced auditory attention. Um, so so. Uh, um, here we can see modality specific differences and uh, you know, uh, uh, that's been um, related perhaps to the tendency of uh, patients with um, reduced auditory attention to um, describe auditory uh, hallucination but far less commonly visual hallucinations. So um, building on this uh, work from the clinical perspective uh, although the principles apply irrespective of the patient group, not just schizophrenics, but there have been several efforts at proposing um, guidelines as to um, how to control intergroup variation um, and, and apply normative uh, data in the clinical setting um, uh, as to uh, um, uh, y use the, uh, the P300 here, not just on a group level, but um, on, a, on an individual level as well. Now I'll just uh, draw the uh, discussion for today to a close um, and uh, I would uh, encourage on this uh, uh, vastly uh, complicated but um, rich topic um, for the interesting reader to uh, refer to uh, the, these uh, p possible readings and of course um, if anyone does have uh, any questions then we'd be delighted to, uh, to receive them using the, uh, the contact details attached here.